Lori Garrett, I want to start with you because I think you were the first person who explained to me in ways that terrified me what herd immunity means. What, what have they signed on to by embracing this declaration? Well, long ago, back oh, six, eight weeks ago, immunologist John Moore from Cornell Weill and I co-authored a piece for Fortune magazine explaining why herd immunity would never work and why it was a, a criminal pursuit, really. Uh, and we've seen around the world every single attempt to wait it out, to just let the virus circulate until some mythological percentage of the population is immune means that you're sacrificing many many members of your population, especially your senior citizens and people living in assisted living programs and so on. And you're, you're basically trading off a high death rate in one community against a relative freedom for another community in your own society. But what they're proposing in the Great Barrington Declaration, which was written by three scientists, one from Oxford, one from Stanford, one from Harvard, uh, with financial support from a foundation that's underwritten by the Koch brothers. Uh, what they're proposing is what they call focused protection, which as far as I can understand it from their br very brief statement, amounts to isolating those vulnerable people from the rest of us and then let everybody go about their business. No masks, no social distancing, uh, no particular protections, go back to school, go back to work. But Lori, I mean, in this country, it hasn't worked like that. We do obituaries every day, and there are basketball players, there are children, there are uh, people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. I mean, that, that doesn't seem to be how the virus is affecting this country. No, not at all, Nicole. In fact, we're, first of all, even here in New York City, where we had the largest uh, epidemic so far in the United States, uh, we never reached better than 21% immunity uh, uh, as measured in standard antibody tests across the population. So if, if the goal was herd immunity, we were going to have to have an enormous death toll to reach that 80 or 90 percent level of protection. Uh, no society has reached that. And the societies that are doing the best all over the world right now in fighting COVID are all countries that have decided not to pursue herd immunity, but instead to go into a a deliberate lockdown followed by cluster studies, places like Japan, Finland, Iceland, New Zealand. These are real success stories. Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, not just rich countries. The point is you say, we're gonna lock down the society, stop the spread of the virus, and then look for isolated outbreaks and jump in with all the tools we have to identify the full extent of that cluster of infection and isolate all those individuals before they spread it out further. And in this way, they've kept their numbers very, very small. Uh, but in the United States, there's a lot of pressure from our financial community, from business community, from uh, all the supporters of President Trump uh, to get us back to some mythological 2019 state where they can you know, rock and roll and hit the bars and have a good time and get business rolling again and reopen all those restaurants uh, as if the virus weren't there. And it's never going to work unless you're prepared to see an enormous death toll. Well, Fingupta, I mean, it's a disease that claimed as one of its victims for severe infection and illness, Donald Trump. So to see his administration signing on to this doctrine, which would have the result, and I remember, Laura, I covered the, the piece that you wrote, and I was staggered and, and horrified by these numbers. And I don't know what it says about us as a country that this number, 200,000 dead, kind of rolls off our tongues. I remember when Deborah Birx and Donald Trump stood in the Rose Garden in April and talked about the possibility of 100,000 Americans dying, and I, I was speechless for hours. Uh, Vingupta, what does it look like in American uh, emergency rooms and hospitals if the president prevails? Nicole, good afternoon. I, you know, just to let me amplify everything uh, Lori just mentioned, which is I and my colleagues would be seeing overwhelmed ICUs where we don't, much less not have, uh, let's not even talk about our ICU beds. We wouldn't have enough ICU nurses, dialysis machines, ventilators to do what we needed to do. We'd be rehashing the realities of March, April in New York City, but nationwide. 
you know, I, and I, I think there's a there's a constant theme here that's emerging. Not that this is the first time, but it's to mislead the American public by by using simple concepts that seem intuitive, like like a focus protection, for example, and and make it seem that you know those of us on the science side are unreasonable not to adopt it. This notion that you can cocoon the elderly in any population and let young people run amok doesn't work. The, the, our own CDC published in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly about a month ago a study which showed that once uh, college-age students returned to campus, for, th there was a spike. I, I believe they looked at a few college campuses in Georgia. There was a spike in cases. Four weeks later, Nicole, there was a spike in the 60 to 69 year age demographic in those same communities. And it's not like they were intermingling. They were trying to cocoon. They were following all the guidelines that we've been telling them to follow. So you cannot cocoon the elderly. That's number one. And then number two is this, this notion that if you're asymptomatic with COVID-19, you're not a threat to others. Again, it's that misleading on basic concepts that the president and his administration continue to do, and it confuses the American people. Oh, if I'm not symptomatic, I must be fine. Focus protection, it must be okay. They're intuitive. They're, they're trying to uh, play on these intuitive concepts, but they're misleading and they're wrong. You know, Jason Johnson, there's something ghastly that we're having a conversation about herd immunity, but we're doing it because the White House embraced this doctrine. Now, my question for you is around all of these issues where Trump's first impression is shock. He seems to have made good use out of that time. Well, we're all picking our jaws up off the ground. He proceeds with whatever diabolical plan he has floated. What do you make of this reporting? The New York Times was the first place that I saw it. But this, this concept is one that he's flirted with for a long time. As Lori says, other countries, uh, I, I think Boris Johnson flirted with it many weeks and months pre his own battle with COVID. Right. But this seems like more than like an accidental leak or a trial balloon. This, this seems like something under serious consideration by this White House. And we should just add that no matter what happens in November, he will be in that building until November 20th. Or January 20th. Right. Yeah, Nicole, I mean, it's not surprising. If we go back to some of the early reporting from just a couple months ago, which seems like a lifetime ago, remember, the White House wanted to do this all along because it, it essentially amounts to doing nothing. We'll just let everybody keep living and whoever dies, dies. And remember, initially, they thought it was only going to affect people in blue states. This is one other reason from a policy perspective. I, like I said, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a doctor. I'm a doctorate, so I can't be like the two doctors here. But here's one of the other reasons <laughs> just from a policy and organizational standpoint why herd immunity doesn't work. We do not know. The scientific community, the policy community does not know yet if once you have COVID, it makes you immune forever. We don't know. That happens with the mumps. That happens with the measles. You know, you can put a family together and say, mm -hmm. okay, everybody gets chicken pox at the same time because we know you won't catch it again. We do not know that with COVID. So the idea that you could pass a policy and say, okay, put your kids back in school. Everybody go back to the mall. Everybody go Christmas shopping. Everybody go to the concert. You don't know that that's going to result in immunity. You know it's going to make people sick. You know more people are going to die. You know more people are going to flood the hospitals. But you don't magically know that in three months, if there's another wave, that people aren't going to catch it. So it's a perfect policy for Trump because it basically amounts to not having to do anything. But it's an idiotic policy from a legislative standpoint and from a medical standpoint. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.